welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing lithium and buspirone. These are going to be two drugs that you definitely need to know for step one. And if you guys don't know, we have already covered our uh, antidepressants from the typical all the way to the atypical antidepressants. And you can find these videos on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash mad medicine, where we have made multiple playlists, both psychiatry and pharmacology, where uh, all of our USMLA step one videos uh, are located. So you can check out our psych and some of our farm videos there. If you guys don't uh, know, you can also uh, like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. And please subscribe. It obviously helps us out. And uh, with that being said, let's start talking about lithium. Lithium is the first known medical therapy for bipolar disorder. And I put this in red because this is definitely something you need to know because it's high yield for step one. When it comes to bipolar disorder, the first uh, line treatment is going to be lithium. Okay. That is the main thing you need to remember because they will ask you which drug should you use to treat this patient who's, prevent, who's presenting with bipolar mania. And the reason why we use lithium is because it, it treats the acute manic episodes, but it not only treats those manic episodes, it also prevents relapsing for patients who have uh, had a history of bipolar disorder. It makes sure that they don't go back into those manic episodes. It keeps those uh, that occurrence low. And so that's why we use uh, lithium practically uh, when it comes to bipolar disorder. Now, obviously, this comes at a cost because lithium has many toxicities, and we're going to talk about those toxicities in a little bit. But because of these toxicities, you can guess that lithium has a very narrow therapeutic index. This, narrow, this very narrow therapeutic index actually contributes to the toxicities because it's very easy to have uh, high levels of lithium based off of drug-to-drug -drug interactions and the intake level and other you know, uh, uh, problems with your body. So in order to prevent these toxicities, we often monitor the level of lithium in our serum for lithium toxicity. This is very important. Uh, it's usually monitored. Now, when it comes to the mechanism of action, we actually don't know exactly what happens, which is good for you guys. You don't need to remember a specific MOA for lithium. But what you do need to know is that lithium is thought to inhibit a phosphoinositol uh, cascade by inhibiting, uh, by inhibiting inositol monophosphatase. That's what we think it does. So when it comes to the basics for lithium, just remember that it's the first line treatment for bipolar disorder, and it's thought to work by inhibiting the inositol monophosphatase uh, in the phosphoinositol cascade. Now, of course, if that was the only thing you needed to know, that would be great, but it's not. You need to understand how lithium kind of functions in our body. And in order to uh, understand the toxicities, you definitely need to know how lithium is excreted. Now, the good thing is it's almost exclusively excreted by the kidney. Now, where specifically in the kidney? Well, it's going to be absorbed in the proximal, proximal convoluted tubule, excuse me, in the PCT via the sodium channels. Now, if you guys remember uh, back in undergrad, you use this one thing called a periodic table, and it looks something like this, okay? And uh, you have hydrogen here, and right under here, you are going to have lithium, and then you have sodium in your third uh in your third row. Now lithium, as you can see, is in the same column as sodium, so it has a lot of the same chemical properties as sodium. So that's why you can think about sodium and lithium as being very closely related. All right. Obviously, they're not exactly the same when it comes to human biologic function, but it's very similar and closely related when it comes to excretion. Now, uh, this is going to be a very big contraindication if there is significant a renal impairment. If someone's kidneys aren't functioning properly and uh, they have some sort of renal disorder that's happening, obviously you can understand that in that case you may not want to give someone lithium because they're not going to be able to excrete lithium uh, in their urine. Right, That is going to lead to higher dosing of lithium and uh, acute toxicity will occur. Now, it's not just kidney impairments, right? Kidney impairments is just one thing that can happen. Another thing that can happen is going to be drug-to-drug -drug interactions. And that makes a lot of sense because lithium is excreted in the proximal convoluted tubule via the sodium channels in the kidneys. Well, 
there are a lot of drugs that can interact with lithium, especially, if, say, if you have a patient who has bipolar disorder and hypertension, and you're giving those patients some sort of antihypertensive drug like a thiazide uh, or a loop diuretic, you m can lead to increasing levels of lithium. So what drugs cause interactions? Well, you need to know that thiazide, like hydrochlorothiazide, NSAIDs and ACE inhibitors are going to cause an increase in lithium levels. It's going to lead to an increase, okay? That's very important. So you might be presented on step one with a patient who is taking uh, a thiazide or who is taking a lanopril, an ACE inhibitor, um, so something like that. Well, if that's the case and those, those patients also have uh, lithium and they're presenting with lithium toxicity, what's the cause? It's going to be drug-to-drug -drug interactions. Now, another drug that you need to know is the case-sparing diuretics like amylaride. These can cause a decreased level of lithium, okay? So when it comes to thiazide, you're going to have increased levels. I mean, with potassium-sparing drugs, you can have decreased levels. And with loop diuretics, you're going to have a varying effect. This can lead to increase or decrease levels. But just know you need to watch out for drug-to-drug -drug interactions when it comes to patients who are taking lithium. Now, that is pretty much all the background information you need to know about lithium. We're now going to go ahead and talk about the side effects of lithium. The, there are several side effects, uh, especially for step one, both in adults and in fetuses that you need to understand and have a good understanding of because you will be tested uh, about lithium in one way or another while you are studying for step one. So let's start off talking about the side effects of lithium. We're going to start off, in my opinion, with the most simplest uh, side effect, which are tremors, right? This is going to be because uh, this is usually going to happen symmetrically in the upper extremities, and this is the most common symptom that occurs. And But this ends up resolving over time. This is not something that lasts long time. Uh, it's, this is an acute symptoms, right? So it's going to be acute tremors. Now, that's the only acute symptom of lithium or the acute side effect you need to know. The rest of these side effects are going to be long-term side effects. So the first long-term side effect is going to be hypothyroidism, right? Lithium is a goitrogen. And if you guys remember, goitrogens suppress thyroid hormone release, uh, that's what ends up happening. They actually prevent the release of thyroid hormone. So what you want to do in this case is you want to treat patients who have hypothyroidism with levothyroxine instead of stopping lithium. You want to supplement the T3, T4 in order to make sure that their thyroid levels become normalized instead of stopping lithium. Because remember, lithium not only decreases um, the amount of the frequency of those events, of those m both bipolar manic episodes, but it also just, you know, reduces bipolar mania and it's used to treat acute bipolar mania as well. So you don't want to stop lithium. You actually just want to make sure you, you can supplement the, the thyroid medication, just the thyroid levels by giving levothyroxine. So that's one of the main long-term side effects So hypothyroidism. The other main side effect is going to be nephrogenic nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, right? It's not going to be centric, centric or central diabetes insipidus because this lithium really doesn't play a main role in your brain uh, when it comes to side effects. It is going to play a huge role when it comes to your kidneys, and therefore it's going to lead to nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Now what ends up happening is you're going to have chronic tubular interstitial nephropathy, which means a patients are going to present with an inability to concentrate their urine. And uh, this, the, this, the main clinical presentation is going to be patients who are polydipsic and polyuric. Uh, they have a lot, they're really thirsty, and they are always peeing. Now, in this case, you want to stop lithium if it's possible, right? That's the main treatment. That's the main thing. Just keep in mind, uh, a question for the US Mali Step 1 might be uh, a phrase, like what is the main side effect you should be worried about? when it comes to patients who are taking medications, first-line medications for bipolar disorder. So first you need to realize that the first-line medication for bipolar disorder is going to be lithium. And then based off of everything that's on the questions, you're going to be able to, or on the answers, you're going to be able to deduce that it's going to be nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. So just keep that in mind. 
Now those are uh, three of the five side effects. The last two are also very important. The first one is called uh, is the fact that you're going to have cardiac side effects like suppression of the SA node, which leads to bradycardia and syncope. And finally, and this is very important, this has to do with the fetus. Uh, lithium is one of the main reasons a baby can be born with something called Epstein's anomaly. Epstein's anomaly is uh, when you have the arterial ventricular displacement of the tricuspid valve. So if this is your normal heart, right? This is your left side, your left atria, and then you have your left ventricle right here, okay? So we're just gonna do this. So this is all myocardial tissue. Okay, so normally your tricuspid valve is located kind of up here, right? In Epstein's anomaly, it actually moves down. So it's gonna be displaced a little bit lower, which means your right atria is gonna increase in size. That's what ends up happening. And the reason why is that lithium is a teratogenic uh, it's not recommended for patients who are pregnant. They should not be taking lithium. And it completely equilibrates across the placenta, meaning it has the effect to uh, cause harm to a fetus when a patient is taking it. For that reason, it is usually discontinued in pregnant patients in order to prevent any cardiac anomalies uh, when it comes, or cardiac congenital disorders when it comes to the fetus. Now, that is pretty much everything you need to know about lithium. I know lithium is a very, very dense uh, drug. There's a lot of things going on, so definitely take your time with this. Make sure you understand everything that is happening uh, for the step one. And now we're going to go ahead and talk about, our last, talk about our last drug, and that is a drug called buspirone. Now, buspirone is a drug that's very similar to velazodone and vortioxetine because buspirone stimulates the 5-HT1A receptors, aka the, five, the serotonin 1A receptors. Now, if you guys remember back to our atypical antipsychotics, we talked about two drugs, right? And those drugs were velazodone and vortioxetine. These were your two, the last two atypical antipsychotics. And both of these also had 5-HT1A receptor uh, stimulation activity. So they are very similar in that sense. Now, buspirone, on the other hand, is not used really for a, a, a depression. It's mainly used for generalized anxiety disorder. Now, keep in mind, SSRIs are still going to be your first-line treatment for GAD. That's always what you're going to go with. But if that doesn't work, you can use buspirone, which is used for generalized anxiety as well. The reason why is that this drug does not cause sedation, addiction, or tolerance. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that it takes about one to two weeks to take effect a lot faster than SSRIs. SSRIs usually take four to eight weeks for it to actually have an effect. Same with SNRIs. But buspirone usually takes one to two weeks and then it becomes active. Now, it also does not interact with alcohol like barbiturates or benzos, so it's very safe to take with alcohol, especially for patients who have general anxiety disorder. This is pretty much everything you need to know for buspirone. And uh, with that being said, thank you so much for listening to this lecture about lithium and buspirone. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel. And when you do, uh, I'd really appreciate it if you guys hit the bell notification so you guys are notified every time we post. We also post these on our podcast, so you can just search Mad Medicine wherever you listen to podcasts and we'll, we'll pop up. Thank you so much and continue on to the next topic.